who are sitting at the podium. I want to take a moment to thank you for taking your time in your busy schedules to come and join us on this momentum occasion. To my uh, sisters, Chairman or President of NAFIO, thank you again. This was last minute, but you uh, had the call and you answered and you jump, jumped up and uh, you are here today. Um, to my sister, Ms. Jackson, to my brother, Kojo Yanka, some of you, I need you to, I have to give a shout out. She's, he's writing a book titled, From Jamestown to Jamestown. I can't wait, it's gonna be a thriller. <laughs> to all my other diaspora sisters, members of Padia, members of Padua, um, we truly are grateful for you taking the time to come here today. Roland Martin back there, this is my first time to see you in person. Mm. A lot of people don't look the same on television. <laughs> I have to say, you look exactly like what I had expected you to look like. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to come here. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is neat and honor to stand in front of you this afternoon to celebrate this momentous occasion. And of course, I always forget my husband, Saab Kwa, he's sitting uh, somewhere back there. Saab, raise your hand, everybody's looking. <laughs> A friend of mine reminded me, because I always call him, uh, he's an old shoe that is very comfortable to wear. And so a friend of mine called this morning and said, so how is the old comfortable shoe? And I said, still very comfortable. <laughs> thank you all again. And my sister Remy, chairman of Padua, thank you again for also always being there, ready to step up and do your part as we come together to uplift our motherland. I took office two and a half years ago as a dumb, ignorant, family physician coming from Memphisboro, Tennessee. I had no idea what I was going to be doing in Washington. As a matter of fact, I thought I actually felt kind of funny and silly thinking me, a medical doctor, can be a diplomat. Uh, but be it as it may, singularly the one thing, I came here, by the way, with no plans of staying. I was coming here top six months after six months, look at my husband and he had tried, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Look at the chairman of the African Union who had appointed me. Thank you, Madam Zuma. It was great, but I could not do it. But fifth month into, uh, into this position, one issue that kept coming to me and became very apparent was the disrespect for the African. I knew it existed. I just didn't understand the depth and the profoundness of it. And not only that, as I began to understand it even deeper, I began to also understand its economic implications when it comes to how we are perceived on the world stage, how this simple fact of simply disrespecting the African had serious implications and is at the root cause of why Africa is not able to move forward. And as I went and tried to understand and dig further to say, what is it about us as black people around the globe? Why is it that we are so disrespected no matter where you go. And I often say, was there a memo sent out to say wherever you go, if you are not a black person, you see a black person, you're automatically superior to them, and you have a right to disrespect them. This memo did not miss anybody. It went to non-black people, but here's the real sugar. It also went to us black people mm -hmm. to say, accept that you are inferior. You automatically take an inferior position. And I'm going to have to tell you something that has become a realization that I just, and this is where I am stuck, as I try to understand how did this message just go through and percolated so through. Now we are on automatic pilot. It's almost as if we've undergone a genetic mutation. Mm. We don't even have to be told. We pass it on to our children. Mm. Have you ever wondered of all the colors on earth, why were two colors chosen? Black color and white color. Follow me on this one. You take a white color, you're associated with Jesus Christ. You're associated with the angels. Yeah. You're associated with purity and everything wonderful and everything desirable. Yeah. And then you take a race that's not even white and you yeah. say you're white. Yeah, so. And then you take another color. You're associated with the devil. Yeah. You're associated mm. with everything undesirable. Yeah. I've never seen a bank robber wearing a white mask. <laughs> All the villains and movies are black. Everything undesirable is black. Yeah, and then you take another race that are not even black. 
and say, you guys, you are black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now go at it. Mm -hmm. As we black mothers are trying to raise our children in our own homes, as much as we try to tell them that you're black and you're beautiful, guess what? The minute they step outside the door, the messages are completely different. A barrage of subliminal messages telling our children that that which you represent is horrible. How do we fight against that? How do I tell my granddaughter that you're black and beautiful, but the world tells her otherwise? The voices echoing her blackness as a symbol of everything undesirable are much, much louder that even we black mothers, we come together, we can never drown those subliminal messages. They were all by design. Let me take you to the beginning, certainly for Africa. Your Africa, your continent. Because as we gather here today, as we try to strategize, as we try to create those linkages between those Africans away from the continent and the Africans on the continent, we must understand how did we get here. And for Africa, it starts with that monumental decision when they the colonizers came together in Berlin in 1884. And let me say, prior to 1884, they were coming to Africa in a haphazard way. They had started with slavery. And then when they felt like they needed the slaves to stay on the continent, they say, oh, we, we no longer believe in slave trade. Let's stop it. No, no, no. It was really just another way of saying the labor is needed on the continent. Let's keep the monkeys on the continent so we can continue to exploit. Uh -huh. So 1884, they met in Berlin to organize themselves so they can effectively loot from the market. They did not meet in Berlin to see to it that Africa would prosper. No. Let me repeat. The colonizers met in order to see to it that your Africa, our Africa, and her children, not only on the continent, are forever defeated and dominated. That was 135 years ago. The manner in which they did it, they took out the map of Africa while the Africans were sleeping, minding their own business. Started to chop up your continent into the tiny little countries that we see today. The bigger and more powerful a kingdom was, the more countries that came out of it. Not only more countries, but these countries were given to different colonizers who spoke different languages. Let me bring it home for a second. Uh, Pretend you're driving from Zambia, mm -hmm. just speaking English. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon you're in Angola, you're speaking Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Then DRC, French, Equatorial Guinea, Spanish, Southern Cameroon, French, Northern Cameroon, no, Southern Cameroon, English, Northern Cameroon, French. You are now in Nigeria, English. Hello. Speak, my sister. These were the same people. Prior to 1884, we were powerful, amazing kingdoms with well-established educational and religious systems. If the truth be told, we had the civilization. We were the civilized. They were the devils, the uncivilized ones. civilization in Africa. To this day, they are still refusing to give up those relics. If those relics were not that good, why are you keeping them? We were way ahead of them in our civilization. They set out to destroy us. And Berlin Conference put the nail on that coffin. So they gave Djibouti the same sovereignty as the United States. They gave Burundi the same sovereignty as China. They gave Togo. You see, the EU realizes individual little countries, they can survive on the world stage. So they come together as the European Union. Mm -hmm. Now picture this now. So they cut up this Africa into the tiny little countries, 
small economies that could never survive on their own, but gave them the same, same sovereignty as the big boys. So that way, when the little bitty countries go to the world stage, for the purposes of development and discussing trade, they want to be boxers who are being thrown into the heavyweight boxing ring every day. How do you put China in the same boxing ring with Iswatini? Iswatini has 1.2 million people. China has 1.4 billion people. And you put them on the same stage and say, go at it, negotiate. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is insanity of the highest order. How have we allowed this carnage to go on? When Iswatini is thrown in the same boxing ring with China and Iswatini is collapsing before Iswatini even gets on the stage, the world says, well, Iswatini, what's wrong with you? Why can't you take care of your people? But China came in and said, Iswatini, give me all your girl or else. And if your team does not agree, they just go on next door to Lesotho and give Lesotho an extra dollar. And if Lesotho doesn't take it, they just jump on to Togo, Central African Republic. It was all by design, 1884. They did something else in addition to chopping us up. They also set out to make the African believe that everything African was bad and undesir undesirable and everything Western, particularly French and British, was more desirable. We call that the legacy of colonization. Prior to that, they started long working on the slaves. Make them think everything about them, forget anything about Africa. Where you come from is a horrible place, diseased and dying people, constantly at war with themselves, uncivilized. Cut out any communications with them. You need to just know what we tell you. And we call that the legacy of slavery. So that's where you look at where we are today. 135 years later, a system that was put in place to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated, that Africa is forever exploited, remains in place today, alive and well. And we sit here and we ask ourselves, why isn't Africa moving forward? Why does Africa continue to be taken advantage of? Well, I'll tell you why, very simply. Until Africa comes together as a continent speaking with one voice, one continent, one people, nothing, and I repeat, nothing is going to change. As individual little African countries, we are wannabe boxers. We will never make it fighting against the heavyweights. We must speak with one voice. Yeah. And this is exactly <laughs> this is exactly what our Pan African leaders wanted to see happen in 1963 when they came together in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. They clearly stated that Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, and that African Union was now. They said Africa must speak with one voice. It is the only way for Africa to take its rightful place on the world stage. Sadly, when they went to Addis Ababa in 1963, they were divided. We had two factions, the Casablanca group and the Monrovia group. The Casablanca group were saying Africa for the Africans at home and abroad and African Union now. This was Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Only seven. The other 25 of the 32 who attended were the Monrovia group. They were the nationalists. They said, let's go slow. Let's kind of wait on this Pan African thing. 55 years later, 56 this year, we're still going slow. As if it wasn't bad enough that we were divided up into the tiny little countries that we are today. The gift that Berlin Conference gave us 
one other thing that France did between 1958 and 1961 in the name of giving us our independence as African countries. France forced the Francophone, and I hate that terminology. There is no such thing as Francophone, Anglophone. They made it up. Yes. But for the purposes of communication, I will use that. 14 of those countries, they said, in order for you to get your independence from us, you must sign this document. You thought they could have found a better name for the document. The document was called the Pact for the Continuation, I repeat, the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. We are talking about giving you independence, but sign this Pact for the continuation of, of colonization, colonization in a different format. Mm. Mm. Yes. And I'm going to highlight some of those issues that they said you must agree to if you are going to be independent. Hello. <laughs> Maybe we need to redefine the meaning of independence for the French. <laughs>
nothing has changed. Mm. The same people who have the audacity to tell us that we are poor countries, they are taking trillions out of Africa every year. Mm. And what is the African doing? Like an obedient program, black man, we just give in. We know the facts, but we just do nothing about it. Now, you have to say some of the fears are real, because the France that has sold you inferior equipment to theirs, France that has trained your military to be inferior to their, to their military, they are now in your country. They can invade you. They have the permission to do so. They can destabilize you. And then one might say, why is it that African leaders haven't done anything about this deplorable situation? Well, let me tell you, my brother and sister, they have tried. Documented to this day, 22 coups where leaders were assassinated. France has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first seven, when they decided they were pulling out of the CFA and that they were going to bring their own money, they were assassinated. Every time an African leader has tried to do what's best for their country, they were assassinated. Majority of them aided by France. Mm -hmm. It's a known fact. And then others, they were just mercenaries who felt that when there was a, a natural resource discovered in one country, they wanted to create a coup. So while the country is thrown into a civil war, they're siphoning the natural resource. Mm -hmm. huh. We know of one particular story that had we not known about it, it would have been, oh, there we go again, the African. In uh, about 25 uh, years ago, a group of young, rich, white kids were having fun in Cape Town. They found out that there was oil in Equatorial Guinea that just been discovered, and they wanted it. So they set out a plan to have a coup in Equatorial Guinea. So while the Guineans are busy fighting a civil war, they will be suffering the oil. But they made one mistake. There were two planes, one was to leave South Africa, stop in Zimbabwe, pick up more ammunition on their way to hunt in Equatorial Guinea. Huh. Another plane was taking off in the Caribbean that had this puppet diaspora who was supposed to be the next president. Mugabe wondered why such young people needed such powerful ammunition to go hunt in Equatorial Guinea. In doing his research further, he found out that this was a coup in the making. He allowed them to land in Zimbabwe. They loaded their plane, and just before takeoff, they were all arrested. The ringleader of that group was none other than the son of the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher. She had to fly to Zimbabwe and pay handsomely to get her son. The last one of those prisoners left Zimbabwe about six, seven years ago. Had these young people succeeded, it would have been another coup. There you go, the Africans again. Hmm. Such, my brothers and sisters, is the story of your Africa. Mm -hmm. They don't do coups anymore. They simply create instability. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So when you hear of an instability in an African country, uh -huh. ask yourself, what is really going on? Exactly. Because what they are telling you is really going on is just a shiny object. Yeah. The real issue is over here. Mm -hmm. And you need to stop before you start being used as an instrument of your own self-destruction. Mm -hmm. They want to throw to you, our oh, African leaders are corrupt. I just love that buzzword. <laughs> Remember what I said, we need to read, we need, we, need, we need to define some of these words for them. Do you really want to know what corruption is? I like to think as black women, and we're going to talk about us black women, we're smart people. There are two things. One is cutting a briefcase with $50 billion, which is what they say, oh, gets out of Africa every year for corruption. And by the way, they only tell you the $50 billion gets out of Africa, they don't tell you where it's going. You see, corruption is a team sport. Ah. <laughs> we want all players. We want all players to come to the table. Okay, fine. We give it to you. Fifty billion is going out of Africa, and then there's another thief over here with a briefcase with five hundred billion sisters. Which one should we go after first? They want us to spend 
time, I am not saying we should not talk about corruption out of Africa. Don't get me wrong. Yes, we must talk about the thieves carrying the $50 billion, but we must also not forget the thief that is carrying $500 billion. Yeah. And by the time that thief is done investing the $500 billion, we're looking at trillions out of Africa. Now, do you see how quickly the $50 billion becomes the larger crumb under the table? And they're busy pointing at you. Well, you see your brother, he got the bigger crumb under the table. I'm like, hell no. I want to be on the table. <laughs> Don't get me stuck in the mud under the table when the real issues are on the table. Yeah. We are not even on the table, my brothers and sisters, yeah. to tackle the issues that truly matter for our Africa. We must realize that. Awesome. Let's refuse to fight over which brother got the bigger chunk under the table. Yeah. That's right. We want to get on the table. Mm -hmm. And the only way for us to get on the table is to understand our circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is to understand how we got here. To see our Africa with 2020 vision. So we, the beautiful, intelligent, sophisticated, highly adaptable, mm -hmm. and totally indestructible, indestructible Africans, can do what we need to do to move our Africa from the doldrums where we were left by the Berlin Conference, from the losing lane that we were left in by the Berlin Conference into the right lane, where we can truly look at our issues and address them as Africans for Africa. So all is not lost, my brothers and sisters. The wishes of our Pan-African fathers from 1963, May last year, rather March last year, the African leaders got together and signed a decision that is now putting us on the path to finish the unfinished business of the Berlin Conference. They signed what we are now calling the African Continental Free Trade Area, where Africa is now going to negotiate as a block, as one continent, one Africa, one heart, one soul, one mind. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. 52 African heads of state signed that agreement. We only needed 22 to ratify. Exactly 13 months later, this is something that the colonizers were laughing at us. You Africans, you'll never put this through. This CFTA thing, you'll never get the ratifications. Years down the line, it's never gonna happen. It's gonna be a piece of paper in a drawer somewhere because the reality is ratifications, my brothers and sisters, do take a long time. They take years. But guess what? 13 months. April this year, the 22nd ratification was deposited to the African Union. We're now sitting on 23 and more are coming. Because you know what? The sleeping giant is rising. The sleeping giant has found her tip and use recognize, let me underscore, the sleeping giant has found her tip. Yes. Yes. Her tip. Yes. Game is over. When I speak to businesses in this country, my mandate is to see to it that Africa and the United States are the best partners the world has ever seen. America, the United States, and the Americas is the only region that has a heritage connection to Africa. Yes. And it is for that reason in particular that I'm on a mission to see to it that the marriage between Africa and the United States is the best marriage the world has ever seen. It is a marriage that's going to give birth not only to many children, but many beautiful children. I'm a woman on a mission. Yes. That's right. Yes. And that's why. That is why it is important that we begin to understand each other. 
that the misconceptions, the misunderstandings, the Africans don't understand the Americans, and the Americans don't understand the Africans. Our Caucasian brothers and sisters come to the negotiating table on a high horse. To them I say, get off your high horse. Yes. Thank you. And we come to the negotiating table feeling automatically inferior. I also say to all of us, you are just as good as anybody else. Yes. Get off that underground. You need to rise up somewhere in the middle. We must rise up, they must come down. And somewhere in the middle is where we are going to have the truly desired, meaningful conversations that are going to take us where we need, we need to be. And this is why we are here today. Thank you. My son Kwame, I thank you for all the wonderful work you've been doing, creating that bridge that's going to get us to the table with a clear mind, clear vision, understanding that when we understand each other, it is then and only then can the children of Africa take their beloved continent to its rightful place on the world stage. The place that we have vacated for far too long, but we are now saying enough is enough. We, the children of Africa, as a united friend, we are going to come join our hands and sing the best melody the world has ever heard as we waltz our way to our motherland, not as 55 African countries, not as 1.27 billion brothers and sisters on the continent, not as over 400 million African diaspora around the globe, but children of one mother Africa. Yeah. Let's give the world the, the best melody the world has ever heard. You see, birds sing not because they can, they sing because they have a song. As children of one mother Africa, we do have a song. Let's join hands. Let's give that world that beautiful song as we waltz our way across, across the Atlantic back to the motherland. I thank you.